Hello, friends. This is lecture five of a series where we go through the book on quantum mechanics by Steven Weinberg. This is part five of chapter three on the general principles of quantum mechanics. As explained in the first lecture, we will be reading the book in the sequence: chapter three, then two, followed by one. And continue from there according to the regular order of the book. In the last lecture, we ended with a discussion of the classical limit of quantum mechanics and how it could be used to determine the Hamiltonian of a system. In this lecture, we shall continue our discussion of the Hamiltonian, in particular its eigenstates and eigenvalues under the conditions of symmetries. Further examples of symmetry transformations in quantum mechanics will also be introduced, and we shall explain what it means for a quantum system to possess symmetries. Let's continue with the Hamiltonian. Much of what we do in quantum mechanics involves solving the eigenvector equation of this operator, that is, finding the energies of a quantum system and the associated states it could occupy. Since the Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator, its eigenstates form an orthonormal basis. The eigenvector equation is linear in the cat E n, and therefore multiplying any solution with an overall constant gives an equivalent solution. The normalization of the cat requires this constant to be a phase. Other than that, it is completely arbitrary. So typically, after solving the eigenvector equation, we would fix the phase convention consistently throughout a calculation. Normally, we would drop any overall phases. One reason why we need to find the eigenstates and eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian is that it allows us to describe the time evolution of an arbitrary state in a simple way. Here's how it works. Suppose that time t equals zero, the system is in some initial state psi, which is expressed in the basis E n. Then, at some arbitrary time later, the system would evolve into some other state psi t, which nevertheless can be expressed in the same basis, except the amplitudes c n of t must now be different. Psi t is just given by the time evolution operator acting on the initial state and satisfies the Schrödinger's equation. Therefore, using the orthonormality of the basis, c n of t is just given by the inner product of psi t with e n. Notice that the bra e n is also the eigenstate of the time evolution operator. So, letting the operator x to its left. We get a simple result, which is just a phase where the Hamiltonian is replaced by its eigenvalue e n, and the bracket between psi and e n is just the initial amplitude c n. This simplification is the result of our choice to expand the state in energy eigenbasis. Note that this solution for the time dependence of an arbitrary state can be obtained. Simply by appending each eigenstate in the expansion of the initial state by a phase with the corresponding energy. Therefore, it is crucial that we solve for the energy eigenbasis as a first step. Then expand the given initial state in this basis, which fixes the initial condition. As the third step, we get psi t with no additional effort. By just adding phases to the energy eigenstates, the energy eigenvector problem is actually the only non-trivial step in all of this, which is why it is usually the first thing we look at in solving a quantum system. Equation one is also known as the time-independent Schrödinger's equation. A simple example will be instructive. Consider a state that is a superposition of just two energy eigenstates. This state evolves in time like so. We are just adding phases of eigenvalues to the corresponding energy eigenstates according to our rule. 
Note that an overall phase can be pulled out of the expression. This phase is unphysical, as it does not affect subsequent measurement probabilities. The actual physical changes due to time evolution is caused by the relative phases between the energy eigenstates. This implies that if we started off with just one energy eigenstate, this state will not change with time. Which is why these states are also called stationary states. But this is true only if the state is the energy eigenstate of the total isolated system, where the total energy is conserved. When we study a quantum system, and have developed some model of its Hamiltonian, in order to verify this model, we need to interact with the system, therefore the total system must include the apparatus or the observer, or at least the signal that is emitted by the system under such interactions, for example a photon. So the eigenstates En are no longer the energy eigenstates of the total system, and therefore the quantum system might transit between these energy states over time since this energy is no longer conserved. It is precisely this process that allows us to measure the energy spectrum of the system. As by detecting the energies of the photons being absorbed and emitted, we can measure the spacings between the energy levels of the system. These show up as spectral lines, and is precisely the type of experiments that lead to the development of quantum mechanics. Therefore, another reason why we solve the energy eigenvector equation is that it has direct measurable effects, which can help us test our models. Let's now look at the symmetries of the Hamiltonian itself, in particular, spatial translation. Recall that for momentum to be conserved under time evolution means that it must commute with the Hamiltonian. This must also imply that the Hamiltonian is invariant under spatial translation, since u can just move past h to find u dagger. This transformation would translate all position operators by A, leaving all momentum operators alone. Thus the conservation of momentum implies that the Hamiltonian possesses translational symmetry. As we can see, this relation also works the other way round. Translational symmetry of the Hamiltonian must also imply conservation of momentum. This must be so, since both the relations in the blue and green box are consequences of H commuting with P. This result is true for any symmetries of the Hamiltonian. For the general case, the conserved quantities are just the generators of the symmetry. Thus conservation laws are synonymous with the symmetries of the Hamiltonian, one implies the other. Let's go back to translational symmetry and look at the implications of the invariance of H on the energy eigenstates. We find that the state obtained by applying the translation operator on the eigenstate En gives another eigenstate which has the same energy. The same argument can be applied to any symmetry that the Hamiltonian might possess. This means the symmetries of H implies that its energy levels are degenerate, more than one state can share the same energy. Applications of U with different parameters on an eigenstate might generate a few more distinguishable states with the same energy leading to multiple degeneracies. This is a general consequence of the symmetries of the Hamiltonian. 
Let's look at the effects of translational symmetry on a typical n-particle Hamiltonian. There's a term that is the sum of kinetic energies and the potential which includes all the interactions between particles. If we apply the spatial translation to this Hamiltonian, the kinetic energy, which is a function of the particle's momentum, will be unaffected as it commutes with u and u dagger. So the non-trivial transformation will be on the potential. The spatial translation would shift the positions of all the particles by the displacement vector a. Therefore, for the Hamiltonian to be invariant, the potential v must be unchanged by these uniform displacements. This is the constraint that must be satisfied by the potential of a Hamiltonian that is invariant under translation. An important example is the Coulomb interaction between a pair of charged particles. Notice that this potential depends only on the difference between particle positions and is obviously unaffected by uniform displacements. In a system of n electrons, we would sum over all possible pairs of such interactions, so translational symmetry is preserved. Such models have applications in condensed matter physics and is used to describe the electrons and solids. Let's look at an example from the single particle case where the particle is moving in a potential that is periodic in position. This implies that the potential is invariant only under some restricted spatial translation A that is constrained by the period. We can't let the potential to be invariant under all translations for the single particle case because this will imply the potential to be constant and is independent of x, which is the trivial case of a free particle. The periodicity of the potential means A must be some integer combinations of the periods LRs. There are three independent periods for three spatial dimensions, although these vectors may not be orthogonal or have the same length. These vectors represent the displacements between the lattice points of a periodic 3D lattice. A typical 2D plane of this lattice looks like this. Each point represents the attractive centers of the potential, and draws the particle towards it as the particle moves through this lattice. We can think of these points as positive ions that form the lattice. Here's how the potential looks along a single axis. The attractive centers are the sharp valleys in the potential. These are of course just simple idealizations and the actual potential could be just any pattern that repeats itself at the same period. The general periodicity of the potential is given in the green box. This shows that V is identical at all the lattice points. This condition is implied by the simpler condition in the blue box which states that the potential at an arbitrary lattice point is identical to that at the adjacent point along any of the three basic displacements, the LRs. This periodicity implies the corresponding invariance of the Hamiltonian. What does this symmetry say about the energy eigenstates? Since the periodicity of the potential is in position space, this suggests that we should project the energy eigenvector equation into the position space of the particle. We denote the energy eigenfunction in position space as psi x. The term h acting on the eigenstate E followed by its projection in the position space, is given by. The way we evaluate this is to let H act towards its left on the position eigenstate X, such that the left-hand side of the equation in the green box 
is not trivially equal to the right hand side. The action of momentum and position operators on the bra X is given by the yellow box. We have derived this in lecture 2. Therefore, all momenta in H can simply be replaced by differential operators on bra X. Similarly, the position operators in H can be replaced by the eigenvalue X. The expressions in the yellow box are the representations of momentum and position operators in position space. That is, they tell us how the two operators act on position space wave functions like psi. This is the representation of H in position space. We shall denote it by the following differential operator. This is just replacing P and X in the Hamiltonian by the rule in the yellow box. The expression in the blue box is the position space representation of the energy eigenvector equation. Next, we shall derive a similar equation for the translated state and make a comparison. Recall that one of the consequences of the invariance of the Hamiltonian under symmetry transformation is that the transformation acting on an energy eigenstate will result in another state with the same energy. In this case, the state you get by applying ULR to the state E must also have the same energy. This is the translated state we have derived earlier. Let's project this equation into position space. Once again, we can use the result of H acting to the left on bra X. For this, we use the representation of H in position space. This is followed by the action of ULR from the right, which results in the translation of the position state. Finally, we can substitute in the energy eigenfunction psi with its position shifted by LR. Compare this with the original unshifted energy eigenfunction equation. We find that psi x and its counterpart, which is shifted by one period, are energy eigenfunctions with the same energy. If we assume that there is no energy degeneracy, meaning any two states with the same energy must be physically equivalent, then the shifted psi is just psi x multiplied by a phase where the phase angle theta could depend on the shift LR, hence the subscript. For the phase to have unique values on the complex plane, the range of theta only needs to be within an interval of 2 pi. We shall discuss the validity of our assumption in a footnote later. For now, let's just assume it is true. From the equation in the green box, it is not difficult to see that we can construct a function that is periodic under the shift LR. Just define a wave vector Q that when dotted with LR gives the phase angle. So if we construct a function phi that is the product of a plane wave with the wave vector Q and a function psi, shifting both functions by LR will then lead to opposite phases which cancels one another.
This leads to the result that the function phi is periodic in LR. We can now write the energy eigenfunction psi as the product of a plane wave with a periodic function. In case you were wondering, doesn't the exponential of iqx looks awfully like an overall phase appended to the function phi x, then shouldn't we just drop it and obtain an equivalent state? This is a mistake if we just look a little closer. In fact, what we have is actually an unitary operator acting on the state phi, then projected into position space. We can't just drop a unitary operator because it has actual physical effects in general, so be very careful. Let's substitute this back into the energy eigenfunction equation and get the corresponding equation for the periodic function phi. First note what the derivative of psi x gives us, given the relation in the blue box. This says that we could move the plane wave EIQx past a gradient operator, provided we add the term i times the vector q. This is the simple consequence of applying the product rule of derivatives to the expression in the blue box. Notice that we could apply this rule for an arbitrary number of times, since we always end up with the exponential of iqx multiplied by some function. Note that when we write del x to the power of n, what we really mean is that there are n derivatives with respect to various spatial components. In this way, we could move e to the power of iqx to the extreme left of the differential operator h, simply by shifting all the gradient operator by iq. The potential operator Vx in H poses no obstacle for this operation, since V commutes with the factor e to the power of iqx. After this step, this factor just cancels between the left-hand side and right-hand side, and we are left with a differential equation for the periodic function phi. Let's deduce some general properties of the solutions of this equation. For a given q, if we solve for the eigenvalue e, we should expect it to take on discrete values that may depend on q. This can be seen from the periodicity of the function phi. In order for it to have a period of L, it must repeat itself for an integer number of times within this interval. Therefore, we should roughly expect the wave number of phi to take on an integer value. If the different solutions for phi is just labeled by the discrete wave number k for a fixed q, then solving the equation in the yellow box for e must give discrete values as well, since it can only depend on the parameter k which is discrete. Therefore, for a fixed Q, the energy eigenvalues consist of discrete levels. However, if we let Q varies over its domain, as indicated in the yellow box, these levels broaden to form continuous bands. This is the energy structure of an electron in the periodic lattice of a crystal. Together with the Pauli exclusion principle, this determines whether a material is a conductor or an insulator. Briefly speaking, the Pauli exclusion principle states that no two electrons can occupy the same quantum state. This means an energy band could be filled up by only a finite number of electrons. When this happens, an electron in this band could be excited only by crossing a significant energy gap to reach the next higher band. In this case, the material would be an insulator. While if an energy band is only partially filled, there is a continuum of higher energy states for the electron to occupy within the band.
Therefore, it takes very little energy to excite it. Thus, the material becomes a conductor. All these will be discussed in more details in later lectures. At this stage, all our key results can be summarized in the following theorem. This is the Bloch's theorem for periodic potentials, named after the Swiss physicist Felix Bloch. We start with the energy eigenfunction equation in position space. For a typical Hamiltonian describing a particle moving in a potential, the differential operator H takes the following form. Now suppose the potential V is periodic with the period L. Bloch's theorem states that the energy eigenfunctions must take the form of a plane wave which represents a free particle, multiplied by a periodic function with the same period as the potential. This is the mathematical result we have derived in the last section. This result is quite general and depends only on the periodicity of V. The domain of the wave vector Q for a fixed period L is given in the yellow box. Recall the relation between the wave vector and the wavelength. Substituting this into the condition in the yellow box, the second inequality implies that the wavelength of the plane wave must be greater than the period L. This means the plane wave must be oscillating slowly with position compared with the periodic function phi. Therefore, if we are concerned with the statistical properties of observables on a large length scale, the energy eigenfunction psi x can be approximated by just the plane wave, since the rapid oscillations of phi x will just average out over this length scale. This is one of the reasons why an electron on a crystal lattice can be effectively described as a free particle. The eigenfunction psi is called a block wave, and the domain of Q is the Brillouin zone, named after the French physicist Leon Brillouin. The Bloch's theorem is the foundation of the quantum theory of crystals and is discussed in most textbooks on solid state physics. Let's now examine the assumption that there is no energy degeneracy for a particle moving in a periodic potential. This is just a footnote to provide additional explanation and will not be required to follow the rest of this lecture. Feel free to skip to the next section if you are comfortable with this assumption. If not, let's continue. In the last section, this assumption allows us to claim that because the energy eigenfunction psi and its shifted counterpart have the same energy, they are in fact physically equivalent. We now drop this assumption and see where it leads. You can find a discussion of this in a footnote in Weinberg's book, chapter 3, page 76. We shall assume generally that instead of just one eigenfunction psi x with the energy E, there are in fact n distinct states with the same energy. We start by labeling these n eigenfunctions conveniently by the subscript nu. When we say that these functions are distinct, we mean that they are also normal. Without loss of generality, we further assume that these functions form a basis such that any eigenfunction with energy E can be expressed as their linear combinations. These basis elements are expressed as functions in position space. We find it convenient to just revert them to vectors in Hilbert space as the basis cats new. Therefore, any state psi with energy E can be expressed in this basis. In order to know the action of ULR on the state psi, we would just have to specify its effect on the basis elements. We can do so in a convenient way by choosing the basis nu to be eigenstates of the operators lr.p 
the generators of U. This basis has a total of n elements, same as the degeneracy of energy. Note that h-bar is explicitly included in the eigenvalues of the generators, so as to cancel a similar factor in the symmetry operator U. These new states are simultaneously the eigenstates of all three generators, since they all commute with each other, and therefore can share the same eigenstates. Because the generators LR.P are Hermitian, their eigenvalues h bar theta are real. We emphasize again that the basis elements nu are also eigenstates of H with the same energy, since H is invariant under the symmetry generated by LR.P. In fact, the energy degeneracy is due precisely to this same symmetry. The entire set of states that are supported by this basis constitute what is known as the degenerate subspace of H with eigenvalue E. The degeneracy of energy is precisely broken by the eigenvalues of these generators. Meaning, different states with the same energy is distinguished by their different eigenvalues with respect to these generators. An arbitrary state in this degenerate subspace is given by psi. Note that the action of translation on the letters ULR on the states nu is given by the following. This we get by exponentiating the eigenvalues given in the yellow box, resulting in just a phase. Now we can apply the result in the green box on how the new bases transform to find out how psi transforms. Therefore, it is sufficient for us to just focus on these new states. As before, let's project this equation in the position space. Once again, we have shown that the shifted energy eigenfunction is physically equivalent to the unshifted one. They differ by just a phase. Now compare with the original statement we used in the proof of Bloch's theorem. For this, we have to assume no energy degeneracy in order to conclude this equivalence. This is a rather unrealistic assumption for a system with symmetries. But the result in a green box is true for any eigenstates of H and the generators of the symmetries. No assumptions need to be made about the energy spectrum apart from the symmetries of the Hamiltonian. Thus we only need to make suitable replacements of eigenfunctions, and Bloch's theorem will still be true without requiring any dubious assumptions. Let's now talk about a different kind of symmetry, the Galilean symmetries. This is a set of transformations that describes how observables appear different to observers that are moving relative to each other. The scenario is as follows. We start with an observer O, carrying with her a coordinate system to observe the world. This is the reference frame O. At time t equals zero, the reference frame of a second observer O prime happens to coincide with that of O. O prime is moving with a velocity minus v with respect to observer O. Suppose O is observing a particle moving with a velocity x dot and is located at position x with respect to her coordinate system. At the same time, the position of the same particle measured by O prime is given by x prime. We assume that both observers are measuring the same time. This is only true because all velocities under our consideration are assumed to be non-relativistic, that is, they are very much less than the speed of light. Otherwise, we would have to deal with Einstein's relativity. Given this scenario, 
it is apparent that at time t, x prime is just equal to the position measured by O, with an added displacement, due to the relative motion between the two observers. The relation between positions measured by relatively moving observers is known as the Galilean transformation. In quantum mechanics, x and x prime would just be the eigenvalues of the corresponding position operators with respect to the reference frames O and O prime. Like all previous symmetries, x prime can be related to x by a unitary transformation. This transformation is also known as a Galilean boost and is generated by a set of three Hermitian operators. Each represents a boost along a spatial direction with the relative velocity v. The position operator x is given in the Heisenberg's picture, therefore its time derivative is given by the Heisenberg's equation of motion. This time evolution is generated by H, which is the Hamiltonian in the reference frame of O. We assume that H is time independent and energy is conserved, therefore the solution of X of T is given by the following. Where UT is the time evolution operator generated by H, this defines the dynamical time dependence. Therefore, from the perspective of observer O, the time associated with the displacement due to the relative motion between frames is like a parametric time dependence. But from the perspective of observer O prime, this time dependence is implicit to X prime of T and is actually part of the dynamical time dependence generated by a different Hamiltonian in the frame of O prime. We shall see this more clearly in a minute. Notice that at time t equals 0, x is invariant under the boost. This is consistent with our definition that the coordinate systems of O and O prime coincide at this time. Let's focus on the left hand side for now. Recall the time dependence of x t. The unitarity of u v allows us to insert u u dagger in between the operators. All three terms are now under unitary transformation individually. The first term is a new time evolution operator generated by the transform Hamiltonian H prime. The expression in the green box is again due to the fact that unitarity allows us to bring in u dagger u into the argument of the exponential to enclose h. The second term is x prime at t equals 0, but as you will recall, this is just equal to x since at this time the two reference frames coincide. The third term is basically the Hermitian conjugation of the first. Putting all these together, we have the new left hand side, which is the transform xt. We can go ahead and also make explicit the time evolution of xt on the right hand side. In this form, we can see that the left hand side, which corresponds to x prime of t, is actually a dynamical variable with respect to h prime in the frame of O prime. Whereas on the right hand side, from the perspective of observer O, there is an additional parametric time dependence associated with the relative velocity. Now we want to relate h prime to h more directly. To do this, it is convenient to bring them down from the time evolution operators by taking a time derivative. Here, we assume that h prime is also time independent, such that energy is conserved for both O and O prime. This way, we could use the Heisenberg's equation of motion in the following form 
for both the left-hand side and the first term on the right. We could further simplify this equation by setting t equals 0, such that x prime is equal to x. In order to better compare the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this equation, we wish to express the second term on the right-hand side as a commutator with x so that it could be combined with the first term. The canonical commutation relation between x and p suggests that this term should be proportional to p. The dot product is between v and p. This is clearer in component form. Here, we can apply the equation in the yellow box. This shows that we have the correct term, which has the right commutator with x. And we are led to the conclusion that the first entries of commutators on both sides of this equation are equal. This gives the effect of the boost on the Hamiltonian. H prime is the Hamiltonian used by observer O prime to describe the system under observation. Note that we have arrived at this result by setting t equals zero. If we further assume the conservation of total energy and momentum, h and p will be time independent, so would h prime as a consequence, and this relation would hold for all times. We shall assume these from here on. Let's look at the example of a free particle being observed by two relatively moving observers. This should serve as a simple illustration of the relation in the yellow box. We first make the following claim that momentum transforms under Galilean boost by the following rule, that is, a particle of mass m will gain an additional momentum simply by virtue of the relative motion between frames. This is quite intuitive, but we shall prove it using the equation of motion shortly. The effect on H, which is purely kinetic energy, is given by this momentum shift. The first term of H prime is just the unboosted Hamiltonian. The second is the momentum term and agrees with the result of the yellow box. If not for the last term, we would have verified our transformation law. But luckily, this term is a C number, which commutes with all operators. This means if we use h prime with this extra term to generate the time derivative of an observable in the reference frame of O prime, the result will be the same as dropping the C number term. Thus h prime is effectively equal to h plus v dot p. In fact, we could go a step further and generalize this result to the multiparticle case. In this case, the Galilean boost of momentum for particle n with mass mn is given naturally by the following. Since for the multiparticle case, we simply sum over the kinetic energy of each particle, the Galilean transformation of H is just a sum over the single particle case. Again, we have a C number term which we just draw to get an equivalent expression. Notice that the individual momenta of the second term sum to give the total momentum which is conserved.
Thus, the multi-particle kinetic energy also obeys the Galilean transformation law in the yellow box. P always represents the total conserved momentum. Now we shall prove the Galilean transformation law for momentum, which is previously assumed. Let's do this for the general multi-particle case. We can prove this using the definition of the Galilean boost on position. For the multi-particle case, we simply need to add a particle index to the position operator. We also need the previous result that relates the time derivative of position operator of particle n to its momentum. Again, this is done using the Heisenberg's equation of motion. Multiplying the equation of motion by the mass mn, we can substitute this result into the right-hand side of the equation in the yellow box. Using this expression, the Galilean boost of the momentum pn can be evaluated. Here, we can resort to using the unitarity of the boost to bring u dagger u into each argument of the commutator on the right hand side. This implies that we have to apply the boost to both h and xn. The previous results could be used. Note that since the term vt is a c number, it automatically drops out of the commutator. Let's split the commutator on the right-hand side into two terms. The first commutator is actually the time derivative of xn in the Heisenberg's equation of motion. The second term can be solved using the commutation relation between p and xn. Recall that p is the total momentum and is assumed to be time independent, hence its time argument is omitted. Therefore, using the relation between velocity and momentum in a general multi-particle system, we have obtained the Galilean boost for momentum. Let's now derive the commutators of the boost k, starting with this equation. This should give us the commutator of k and pn. For this purpose, we again use the trick of using an arbitrary infinitesimal transformation, keeping only terms up to first order in v. in order for the right-hand side of this equation to be proportional to v. The commutator of the components of k and p needs to be proportional to the identity, delta ij. Thus we have the commutator between the boost and the momentum operator of particle n. Next, we shall derive the commutator of k and h. The Galilean boost of H, which we have found earlier, would be helpful for this task. Once again, the commutator could be easily obtained by assuming an arbitrary infinitesimal boost where V is kept to the first order. In fact, we could arrive at the following equation straight away if we recognize some generic forms associated with an infinitesimal transformation. Recall previously. The commutator of the generator with an observable is always equal to its change under transformation. Thus, in an analogous way, 
The transformation in the yellow box would imply the following. So we obtain the commutator between the booths and the Hamiltonian. Since this is not always zero, it means that the eigenstates of k are not eigenstates of h. Therefore, the eigenvalues of k cannot be used to distinguish between states with the same energy. The fact that k and h do not commute has another consequence. Using the Heisenberg's equation of motion, the time derivative of k is also not zero, that is, k is not conserved. Next, we look at how different booths combine to form a single transformation. This will allow us to derive the commutators between different components of K. Let's consider two consecutive booths that will bring us from observer O to O prime with a booth of V1, then from O prime to O double prime with V2. The observed position x prime is related to x by the usual Galilean transformation. A similar relation connects x double prime to x prime. We can substitute x prime in the blue box by the expression in the green box, thus relating x double prime to x. Notice that v1 and v2 can be combined in this result. The boost of x by v1 followed by v2 is given by this last expression. We can see that the expression on the right hand side of this equation is actually a single boost with a parameter that is the sum of two velocities. Comparing the single unitary operator on the right hand side with the product of two unitary operators, representing the two consecutive booths on the left. We get the following relation. This says that the combination of two arbitrary Galilean booths is simply equal to a single booth with a velocity that is the sum of the two. This immediately implies that the different components of K commute with each other. We can see this by referring to our old friend, the CBH formula, which says that the product of two unitary operators is given by another, with an exponent that is the sum of the generators of the two, followed by additional terms that are composed entirely out of the commutators of these two generators. A transformation law like those in the yellow box implies that these additional commutator terms must all be equal to zero for arbitrary parameters which leads to the conclusion in the blue box. We have used this exact same argument for the case of translation to deduce that all momentum operators must commute. We now talk about another way of looking at symmetries. Canonical transformations and the laws of physics. Let's define each of these terms. In quantum mechanics, a canonical transformation in the Heisenberg's picture is simply the unitary transformation of all observables. In the most general sense, we make no assumptions about any structures or symmetry groups about these transformations, except that they must be unitary. The laws of physics here refers to the formalism of quantum mechanics, which consists of one the commutation relations between canonical conjugated pairs of variables. A canonical transformation will preserve these relations, hence the name. Number 2. The Heisenberg's equation of motion. All observables must evolve in time according to this equation. Under a canonical transformation, an observable must still obey this equation, although the Hamiltonian itself could be transformed. We can show that these two postulates that underlie quantum mechanics will be preserved simply by the unitarity of operator U. If U relates the observations between two observers, for example, like the Galilean transformation, 
then what we are saying is that the laws of physics must be the same for all observers. This postulate lies at the foundation of physics. Another way of looking at this is that you could represent a change of variables that we use to describe the system. Our choice of variables should not affect the laws of physics. We now proceed with the proof that U preserves 1 and 2 from unitarity. It is quite apparent that 1 is unaffected by unitary transformations because the right-hand side of the equation is a C number. We define the transform variables according to the rule in the yellow box. Therefore, we can see quite simply that the canonical commutation relation is unchanged by the canonical transformation. Next, we look at the second postulate. From our earlier discussion, if we assume that H is time independent, then the equation of motion has the following solution. Where we suppress the time argument of A at t equals 0. What happens if we perform a canonical transformation on A t? Using the expressions in the yellow and the blue box, the transform observable A prime of t is given by. We can insert u times u dagger due to unitarity and get the following result. The middle term is just given by A prime at t equals 0. For the two terms on either side, we can bring in u dagger u right into the argument of the exponential to act on h directly. This is again due to unitarity. So h is transformed into h prime. h transforms under the same rule as any observable. We see that a prime at time t is just the time evolution of a prime at t equals zero generated by the transform Hamiltonian h prime. If we further assume that h prime is also time independent, just as before the transformation, then the time derivative of a prime will lead to the same Heisenberg's equation of motion. This completes the proof that a canonical transformation preserves the equation of motion. That is, we can replace all observables by their transformed versions, including the Hamiltonian, and they will satisfy the same equations of motion. Therefore, we have arrived at yet another way to define symmetries. These are transformations that preserve the laws of physics in the sense which we have just described. This is more general than our previous understanding because the Hamiltonian need not be invariant under transformation. Consequently, there may not be any conserved quantities associated with it. Whereas for the case with invariant H, the generators of the symmetry are always conserved. The Galilean boost is one such example of a symmetry that does not preserve the Hamiltonian. Its generators are therefore not conserved. However, this does not mean that the symmetry is arbitrary and empty of physical content. In fact, this transformation law that has to be obeyed by the Hamiltonian of any system in a world that possesses Galilean symmetry constitute a symmetry constraint on the system and restricts the physical form H could take.
Let's take the multi-particle system as an example, where the particles move under general potential. From a previous discussion, we know that the condition in the green box is already satisfied by the kinetic term. So how would the same condition constrain the form of V? Note that H prime is assumed to be time independent, so is H. Together, this implies that P is also time independent and therefore conserved. This also means that H possesses translational symmetry and therefore can only depend on the differences between particle positions. This form of V also implies that the Galilean boost of particle positions given in the blue box, which takes the form of uniform translations, has no effect on V. We could take this the other way round, since the kinetic term of H already satisfies the condition in the green box. V then needs to be invariant under the uniform shifts in particle positions, as stated in the blue box and is therefore forced to take a form which is dependent only on the differences in particle positions. So as a whole, H now satisfies the symmetry constraint. This shows how Galilean symmetry affects the way particles interact with each other in the form of V. Let's work through another multi-particle example. In case you were wondering whether a Hamiltonian would automatically have Galilean symmetry once it is invariant under translations, we will now cook up one that has translational symmetry but not Galilean. This Hamiltonian singles out a particular particle, particle 1, in the dot product, but is otherwise composed entirely out of momenta. Therefore, it is trivially invariant under spatial translations. Galilean transformation is achieved as before by shifting all momentum as in the blue box, which gives the transformed Hamiltonian H prime. The dot product between these two terms in the brackets simply gives us the original Hamiltonian as defined in the green box. The dot product between these two gives the following corrections to H. Note that we are assuming that all particles have different masses, therefore M1 does not typically cancel with Mn in the denominator. Whereas for the dot product of these other two terms, Mn do cancel as they match up between the numerator and the denominator. The dot product between the two remaining terms is just a C number, as in the earlier example. Let's drop this C number as before and look at the operator corrections to H due to the Galilean boost. This term is obviously not equal to the one prescribed by the symmetry constraint. Therefore, our multi-particle Hamiltonian does not possess Galilean symmetry, even though it is invariant under translations. Once again, we have shown that if a quantum system obeys a certain symmetry, this has actual physical consequences to how it evolves in time in the form of its Hamiltonian. We have reached the end of this video. This concludes Chapter 3, Part 5 of Weinberg's book on quantum mechanics. If you find this video helpful, consider giving it a like and subscribe to this channel so that you can follow along as we go through the whole book. See you next time and thanks for watching.